hungry for this afternoon's sessions. Um, it was a great opening uh, morning, and I think we had a few themes there which we'll pick up in the, the conversations to come. I think one that struck me was that moving on from the talk of dynamism and fresh thinking and innovation and starting to put some, some flesh on the bones there and, and what does it really mean and look like at, at individual institutions. One of the things that came through in the, the session just now um, with Leanne in particular, our entrepreneur, was that um, the best students for employers and for the new careers, the sort of you know, relatively undefined careers that students are going into now, tend to have cross-disciplinary backgrounds uh, and expertise. And another theme which hasn't come out in the, the conference here yet, but which is often discussed, and I've certainly heard discussed at, at similar events, is, is the tech skills gap that exists. And I think our next session will uh, bring those two issues together and, and give us an example of how one university is doing some really extraordinary um, reimagining of the way that uh, skills, and, and tech skills in particular, and higher education in, in general can be delivered. So this promises to be a, a fascinating keynote. I'm very pleased to introduce, uh, to deliver it, Carla Broadley, who is Dean of the College of Computer and Information Science at Northeastern University in Boston. Um, she's previously been a professor in the Department of Computer Science at Tufts University and was also based at Purdue University. Um, her keynote this afternoon is entitled Computer Science for Everyone, and uh, we will have time for Q&A afterwards. So please welcome Carla. Thank you. I want to spend just one slide telling you a little bit about Northeastern. We've been around for over 100 years, but we like to think of ourselves as a young university because we keep reinventing ourselves. Until about 30, 35 years ago, we were a commuter school. We were um, a school that had a lot of classes at night. We were considered a school of last resort if you lived in, in Boston. and. Um, we reinvented ourselves in the last 30 to 40 years to be a research one university. So the other thing that distinguishes Northeastern from a lot of other schools, at least in the United States, is, um, sorry, I thought someone was talking to me, um, is um, that we are what's called an, a co-op school. I think you call it work integrated learning in Australia. But what this means is that all of our students go out on really long, co-ops, six to eight months, and they go on multiple co-ops in uh, industry, in government, um, in nonprofits, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So in terms of size, we have 24,000 students, 17,000 of those are undergraduates. Because our, most of our undergraduates stay for five years, at any given point we are only teaching two-thirds of those students. And we have over 1,200 faculty. And we're divided into nine different colleges. Computer and information science is one of the colleges. Um, so within the college, um, which has the distinction of being the very first college of computer science in the country, um, we have many faculty, both um, research faculty and teaching faculty. We have 30 undergraduate degrees. 30 undergraduate degrees in computer science, what on earth does that mean? It's because they're combined with other disciplines, and I'm going to talk about those in a moment. We have six uh, master's degrees, four different PhD degrees, and we have a lot of students. And in fact, that first number, I think, is going to be 1,400 after this year's intake because of the popularity of computer science. So what do I mean by computer science for everyone? The first, I want to talk to you about all of the programs. So I have a fundamental belief that not everyone should be a computer scientist, but that everyone should know a bit of computer science. If I ask my middle-aged friends um, who uh, went to school in the States where you had to take chemistry, biology, and physics, and there's absolutely nothing disparaging in this remark, Brian, um, that if they took one of those three subjects, would they have liked to have replaced it with computer science? And almost all of them say, yes, I would have really liked to have taken computer science. That would have been very useful. So what is a combined major? A combined major is like a double major, except that if you do a double major, particularly at Northeastern, you have so many requirements 
to fulfill both of them that you don't have any ability to look outside of those two disciplines. So what we did was we sat down with different departments across the university and really thought about what does it mean to put biology together with computer science? What does it mean to put digital art together with computer science? And we came up with the curriculum and the required courses from both and sometimes invented new courses that put them together that made sense with respect to those two disciplines. So I'm showing right here the picture of what it looked like when I showed up. I don't want to claim I invented this idea. My predecessor um, invented the idea. And we had two undergraduate degrees in computer science and information science. And we had combined them with degrees that made sense to us and degrees where students had come and said, I'd really like a combined degree in journalism and computer science. And so we created one. And then we found more students wanted to do that combined degree as well. Here's where we are right now. We now have four undergraduate degrees. Uh, we've added data science and cybersecurity. Just this summer, we added um, combined degrees with uh, our College of Social Sciences and Humanities, particularly in English and in history and philosophy and in sociology. And what we've seen this past admissions and application cycle is that applications to social sciences and humanities are up over 20%, and it's from the combined degrees. Here's where we're going. We want to create combined degrees in any way it makes sense and we'll probably let it be somewhat student-driven uh, in terms of just offering to all of the students across the university. If you want to combine a degree with computer science, we'll figure out how we can do that with you. And um, so these are just a few of them. And I, I imagine we'll have, you know, I don't know how many we'll have in the future, but we're open to having combined degrees with everything. This is an example of a combined major with computer science and journalism. You can see that there's basic computer science courses on the left, and then on the right there are the journalism courses. Now why is this exciting? If a student does a combined degree in computer science and journalism, they will be eligible for one of our new co-op positions with the New York Times, where New York Times is posting positions with us for our co-ops, our co-op students, think long internships where they apply both the computer science and the journalism. And in particular, one co-op position there is about looking at how do you look at the click-through data to try to understand trending. And so you need both data science, but you also need a fundamental understanding of journalism as well. And we want to create these opportunities as well. So the result is 50% of our undergraduates in the college are doing combined degrees. I'm showing right now the most popular historic degrees, business, game design, mathematics, and interactive media. But we've just introduced many of the new combined degrees, so I don't know if those will remain popular. The second idea, so, so combined majors are about where someone really wants to embed computer science and mesh it with another field. Meaningful Minors um, is an idea that, um, that came to me a, a, a couple of years ago. And, oh, and by the way, I should um, remember to call them Meaningful Minors in Computer Science because the other deans have pointed out that their minors are meaningful also. Um, so Meaningful Minors in Computer Science are, you don't need to major in computer science, but if you do a minor, it should be relevant to what your major is. So everybody takes the same two intro courses, and then what courses they take after that, a minor is five classes, what courses they take after that comes through advising. So for example, an English major might take natural language understanding and data visualization, whereas a biology major might take computational biology. And so the idea is, is that you should learn the computer science that's relevant toward what your primary field of interest is. Now, the original um, minor that we had had six, six courses and really had a lot of trouble attracting students because they couldn't see why it was relevant to English or why it was relevant to biology. Our new minor is very, very popular and it has very different requirements. And in particular, of the five courses, one course can satisfy requirements in both the minor and in the major. So we looked across the entire curriculum of Northeastern on all the all classes, and we narrowed it down to about 10% that looked sort of relevant. And then we had a committee go through and decide, is this course that's offered, 
in another field, for example, digital photography, does it have enough computer science in it that we'll feel comfortable having that be part of our, our uh, minor? And I did rule out um, courses like dystopian literature because although the caricature of a computer scientist is that they like to read dystopian literature, I don't know that that counts for computer science education. So we ended up with 108 of these options. But what's really exciting is that now new courses are being created that satisfy both. And I'm going to give two examples. One is a course we piloted last year called Bostonography. It's basically all about the city of Boston. You take it as a freshman. It's about the data. It's about text. It's about maps. And it's taught by our digital humanities faculty. At the same time that you take this, you have to take our Intro to Computer Science, our programming class. At the end of the semester in the Bostonography class, you do a project based on the data in the class where you write the code to analyze the data. And this has been wildly popular. Uh, a second example of a very popular class that satisfies both requirements, where it really shows you what the relevance of computer science is, technology and human values. And that talks about philosophy, ethics, and the relationship between technology and humans. And it's particularly germane if you're interested in learning about human-computer interaction. And the result is that non-majors are on the rise, and we expect to see a huge and terrifying jump next year. Um, the, the next area that we really thought about was in our master's program, and really how do we create what I'll call diversity of thought. So there's two ways that you can do this. One is you can have these, I, these programs that are combined, and what I'm showing here in the red circles are all of the different colleges, um, the College of Science, the College of Arts, Media, and Design, Bouvet is our health sciences. And then I'm showing the programs that have lines between them as ones that are offered by both colleges. So an example, health data analytics is something that we offer with health sciences, where you really need to know both fields. And I'm showing some of the interdisciplinary master's <laughs> programs. And we could keep creating these. And um, that will, you know, we could, we could start doing the same thing that we do with our undergraduate. And, and these were created more for what was needed in terms of our co-op employers the industry that we work with. So we, these, these new interdisciplinary degrees were developed with respect to what does the job market need as opposed to what do the students want to do. So there's a difference in, in the um, reasoning behind them. The second program that I really want to talk a lot about is the Masters of Computer Science for people who studied something other than computer science as an undergraduate. In the United States, we have abysmal um, diversity statistics in computer science. There are a few notable exceptions. Harvey Mudd, which you'll hear from later, uh, I think tomorrow, is one of them. But for most programs, there's uh, under 16 percent women, 14.1 percent women undergraduates for Research One universities, 3.2 percent African American, and 6.8 Hispanic. And this is not the same demographics as our population. Obviously, we have about 50% women. And so there's a cultural problem about around computer science. Our, in fact, things have become much worse. When I studied computer science in 1982, 83, 84, uh, there were about 30% in my classes. And since then, it's gone down. And there are lots and lots of things you can read about this. The media, shows like Silicon Valley, don't really make most people want to hang out with those human beings. Um, and so what do we do about it? Well, based on my own experience, I was an English major when I started university. And one of my friends came home one day and to insult me told me she thought I would like computer science. And I thought, well, what's that? And uh, this is 1982. So I went and I, I took my first computer science class and I fell in love. I still remember the first program I wrote. I wrote Newton's method in Fortran. So exciting. Um, sorry. <laughs> and I decided to change my major. So when I was both at Tufts and when I started out at, at Northeastern, I really looked at what happened in our intro course. How many students who tried computer science went on to take the second degree? And was it biased by race or gender? And I found that 75% of people that tried computer science liked it enough to take the second class, and 75% of people who took the second class liked it enough to do a minor or a major. Now, of course, there are professors that I could put on that course where nobody would like it, but I'm assuming that the person is a genuinely good, kind human being who can teach. 
So we have all these wonderful programs, particularly geared toward K through 12 to try to involve um, women in underrepresented groups in computer science. We have stuff going on at the college level. But last year, at least in the United States, 1.3 um, million women and 400,000 underrepresented minorities graduated not in computer science. And we have this huge appetite for more trained computer scientists. So we created a program where students come in and they do a two semester post back two semester bridge program. They go into the professional master's program and then they also go out on a co-op. And what's really amazing is the reaction from the employers. I was really struck by what Leanne said earlier. I don't know where Leanne is. Um, what Leanne said earlier about really needing to have people who can bring two types of thought together. Employers love these students and really have asked for more. So we're now scaling this program. And this is a, a, a word um, map of all of the degrees. And you can see some ones in there, like little ones like classics. We even have a previous theater major. We've got literature. Um, the largest, of course, is business, mathematics, and economics. So these students are coming from every degree. They've never had computer science. They're staying, they're getting a master's, and they're getting employed by the top tech companies um, in the United States, like Facebook and Google and Amazon and so on. And Northeastern has uh, professional master's campuses in multiple areas. So we piloted the program in Seattle, and now we have brought it to Boston, Charlotte, Silicon Valley, and we'll be going to Toronto as well in the near future. So I want to say just a little bit um, in about five minutes, because I'm going to run out of time, about, um, oh, no, that's going down. Thank goodness. I was going crazy. It looked like I'd been speaking for 25 minutes, and I thought, I haven't been speaking for 25 minutes yet. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about co-op and experiential learning and how this is really integrated with this idea of computer science for everyone. So first, let me just tell you about how it works at Northeastern. Our undergraduate students can choose either to do two or three six-month co-ops. It depends on how many advanced placement credits they have from when they were in high school. And our graduate students complete one six to eight-month co-op. And the idea is this, this prepares them for a lifetime of learning. And what we see is students go out on their first co-op experience at either 18 months or, or two years. When they come back, they're no longer thinking about their grade. They're thinking about what can they learn that will help them on their job. It's helping them refine what kind of job they want. I tell students, try three things. Try a bank where you're more of a service industry. Try a company, a large software company like Amazon, and try a startup and see what do you like? What kind of environment do you like? What would you like to do? So they gain a lot of wonderful experience. And we really see this reflected when um, we go out and ask employers. So this is the, the, the cycle. We have a whole curriculum around this. We have co-op faculty who teach the students how to go out on co-op, how to prepare for an interview, how to behave like an adult. We're almost always successful. Um, so they take a co-op course. They work together with um, their co-op. Um, faculty member about what it is that they really enjoy and like to try to get them ready to think about which co-op experience would they like. They go out on co-op. When they come back, they do reflections. They do an assessment of the co-op and we get rid of companies that don't give our students good learning experiences. We call the employer, not just at the end, but in the middle to make sure that they're showing up to work. We had one student who thought flex time meant showing up at 11 and leaving at 4. And um, uh, we were able to self-correct. And then they do the cycle again. So these are two examples of a four-year versus a five-year. I'll just look at the bottom one, a five-year, where they go to school for fall and spring. They have a, they have a vacation. It's their only vacation. Um, then they come back and they go to school, and then they go out on co-op. And our co-op cycle runs from uh, July 1st through December uh, 31st and through January 1st through June 30th. And you stay on the same cycle. So you interleave after the first year and a half to two years, you interleave going out on co-op and coming back and learning. And this really focuses. I like to tell the example of the head of marketing for computer science actually went to Northeastern. And uh, she told me she was a physical therapy student. And I said, 
well, how did you get there? Because you graduated in business. She goes, I went out on my first co-op and, well, I realized they didn't really like touching other people. And so she became a business major. She's very good at it. So um, Northeastern usually ranks one or two in Princeton Review for um, uh, job placement. And 90% of our students are employed full-time or in graduate school within nine months of graduation. And this is the university as a whole. It includes arts, media, and design. It includes social sciences and humanities. And 89% of those who are employed are employed in the discipline in, in which, or closely related discipline to which they studied. The numbers are different for computer science. That first number is 100%. Um, and again, Northeastern-wide, 50% receive a job offer from a previous um, co-op employer and you know most of them are happy they went to Northeastern. So we did a survey um, to try to understand whether or not we were preparing our students, um, I will say better than other universities. And so we did a, a survey of um, over a thousand employers in the Boston area and um, we did it by first asking them about how good they felt about their, their um, their recent graduates they'd hired. And then after we did that, we asked them how they felt about their particular Northeastern students that they hired. And then we also reversed the order of the questions to make sure there wasn't bias in, in, the, um, in the survey. And we knew also which employers had Northeastern students and which didn't. And we found that overall, 89% of employers that had hired our graduates were felt that they were fairly prepared and only as compared to 49%. And you can read this study. Uh, this is just drills down a little bit more um, in terms of not prepared at all to highly prepared and the um, the red bar is northeastern and then we went and we looked at in deep and gory detail about what they were um, prepared for and I love some of these like tactfulness um, <laughs> Creativity. I'm not quite sure how you how you mentioned that. Now, I would say that Northeastern still has a ways to go because the uh, maximum on this was six, and we didn't get sixes. Um, so, how do we do this? We have over three thousand different co-op companies as a university, or or um, nonprofits or government agencies that students go to work for. And so, as young universities, you know, you have the option to really think about how to set this up as opposed to a university that's been around for a long time. And in 2016, we had close to 10,000 students that went out. We have 3,000 co-op employers across every continent, including Antarctica. There's no companies there, but there is some research going on. In 80 countries, we have 85 full-time faculty members who both get the students ready to go out on co-op, but who also do what's called the job development and trying to find opportunities with new employers. And we have um, both domestic and a global employer relation team. We do all of the visa uh, processing. And it's integrated with the curriculum. And every system in the university is adapted in order to work with this, the way our housing works, the way our meal plans work, the health, safety, and security. We have, a, if we have uh, people out on co-op in various countries and something happens in that country, we know where they are and we get them back safely. So in terms of our college, here's an example of some of the co uh, companies that work with us. We have 500 co-op companies. And I want to give three examples of three different students who did combined majors and how they were able to use both parts of what they learned in their co-op experiences. So, so Nick was a computer science and interactive media um, major, and he worked at a company called Flex. And one of the projects he, uh, he mentioned he was particularly proud of was they were asked to build a hoodie that had earphones embedded inside of it. And they were able to do this in 24 hours. So Flex is a consulting company that comes up with quick manufacturing um, solutions. And he, when asked, he felt like his interactive media skills really gave him the ability to use the graphic design and the art classes that he'd had, and the computer science skills, he could write code, was I think the, the summary. So that's one example. The second example is Mackenzie, who is a combined major with music, and she's working at a game company in Berlin. And she felt like she was able to put her music skills into the sound and the music for the games, whereas her programming skills allowed her to actually write the code to put the music in. And she has a really nice um, 
uh, quote that she wrote um, um, to me when I asked her for a little more detail. As the games I make myself, I've already done basic sound and music for a small mobile game I released, Eternal Flop Nation. I don't know what, I haven't played it, I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> And that's what focused my independent study last fall, finishing three pieces, two of which were performed live at the end of the semester. So you have someone who's been able to put two things she loves together and make money from it. The last example is um, a student named Erica who is a combined major with uh, communications and she worked at Snap App and what she did there was interactive content design um, creation engine and user interface and what she's really really loves is the fact that she can put her communication skills to work with her technical skills to really think about how to do the best design interface for the program. So we don't just stop with learning we're really focused on interdisciplinary research and what I'm showing here is in the red circles are all of the different colleges. Again, we have the College of Science, the College of Arts, Media, and Design, and so on. And my college, Computer and Information Science, is in the center. The uh, gray dots are faculty that we already have. The yellow dots are my open searches for this year. And I'm particularly proud of the fact that we're finally going to have a joint faculty member with law. That one was a long time coming. And so these 17 current interdisciplinary faculty really have appointments in both. They're tenured in one college, but they have teaching responsibilities in both, and they have service responsibilities in both. And they do um, interdisciplinary research. And because of that, that's led to a lot of interdisciplinary PhD programs. Um, we have four PhD programs, one in computer science, one in personalized health informatics, which is joint with health sciences. Um, we have. Um, one, information assurance and cybersecurity, that's joint with electrical engineering. And the last one is truly interdisciplinary, that's our network science program, which is joint with, uh, with almost every college on campus and has people from social sciences and humanities and physics and, and whatnot. And we have students that come from all kinds of backgrounds for that as well. And I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. This is a, a um, project that came out of the personalized health informatics PhD program, one of our researchers was looking at how to integrate game design with health to get families to compete together and in terms of trying to improve their healthy eating and lifestyle. And so she created an app for this. It's been very popular in one of our local communities. Um, a second example in, from our Network Science Institute, uh, Alex Vespignani does a lot of work on modeling when disease outbreaks are happening and he uses all kinds of data so it's a combination of really needing to be able to process big data, um, needing to understand things like travel patterns in order to predict um, where diseases are going to travel and to think about how to mitigate them. So what are some of our alums doing? Um, I really like the startup that Rudy and Tony did. They have. Um, they make apps. And they became somewhat famous um, when they went on the Chelsea Handler show for an app they um, created, which was, um, I forgot what it was called. I think it was, maybe it was called Get Out of Here, where you could um, program a message to yourself if you were out on a date that would seem really real, like, oh my god, the dog is loose, or, um, or this is your mother. I need you to call me right now, so that if you're date wasn't going well, you could show that you weren't lying and show, th and, and show um, the text. But that being aside, they were, um, they were joint computer science and business majors. They went and started a, a startup and they've been very successful. Um, Teresa works at The Gap and she, although she was not a, a joint fashion design and computer science major, she's been able to use her, her math skills this is before we had um, a data science degree, and to really understand all of the data behind what's happening. And then the last one I just like because it's one of my favorite companies, um, and that is um, the CTO of Lyft is one of our alums, and um, he came from a long time ago. But he, um, he really embodies one of the things that I like about um, he studied all kinds of things besides computer science. He didn't do a combined major, but he really thought about humans. And it's one of the reasons that I believe Lyft treats their, um, you know, their drivers in a very different way than another, um, perhaps, company does. I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. um, 
so computer science for everyone. What we've done is we've integrated computer science with other disciplines in several ways, using curriculum, research, through faculty hiring, and through the co-op program with experiential learning. And why do we want to do this? We wanted to increase not only the diversity of demographics, but we also wanted to create diversity of thought. What would your iPhone apps look like if they had been created by a more diverse population? What would your what would all of the technology that exists out there look like if there had been someone who had been an undergraduate major in English or in theater or in classics creating that app? And finally, I believe that by bringing these disciplines together, we have the ability to ultimately have greater innovation and disruption in industry and research in tech. Thank you. Thanks, Carla. We have, we have 10 minutes now for, for some questions. I'll just kick things off with, with one. Um, picking up really on the point you made at the end, I, I, two or three weeks ago I interviewed uh, Randy Zuckerberg, who, um, as the name suggests, is um, the older sister of Mark Zuckerberg and was one of the first uh, employees of Facebook um, back in 2005, whenever it was. And she has been quite a, a big critic of Silicon Valley, as many people are now, because of the very homogenous nature of, of employees of the tech firms. But the point she was making was um, that diversity was necessary, not just because it's nice to have or the right thing to do, but because actually without diversity, the technology itself suffers. And I think she said that Facebook itself would have internationalized much quicker, for example, had it had a broader range of employees early on in its, in its, um, its sort of genesis. But also she said that if you look at, at Silicon Valley now, um, largely because of the very homogenous nature of the people coming through, the sort of rich, young, white men from you know, a small number of Ivy League schools, um, you actually get, for every Facebook or Google, you get a million um, entrepreneurs who are setting up luxury apps for luxury car valet services, for example, you know, trying to solve problems that just aren't problems for the real world. And I wonder what you think your, your approach, which brings... I assume diversity to the tech industry, not just in terms of racial diversity or more women coming into the sector, but actually people from a diverse range of academic backgrounds. What do you think um, that will do to, if it's you know, picked up in a big way? What will that do to sort of the next phase of technological development over the next five years? So? Oh, I think it's hard to imagine because we haven't had it yet, but um, I will say that um, the early data on the programs that we've created around diversity, so I'll give an example, the um, masters for people who studied something other than computer science. So um, as a college, we have about a 75% conversion rate from co-op to full employment, meaning 75% uh, of our students who go out on their third co-op are offered um, a full-time position. I mentioned for the university it was 50%. For the students that come out of this program, it's 100%. And I'm, some point it's going to have to dip below because someone won't do their job right. But right now, 100% of those students are offered a job and the employers have come and said we need more of these students because they're able to come in and really change the way the team thinks um, when they're developing. But I think it's too early, um, too early to tell. And you know, I think one other thing is really important in that even if someone stays within discipline, that they learn the communication skills. So I forgot to mention one other thing we did, which is kind of funny. Um, our uh, final, one of our final courses in the senior year is to uh, ask students to learn how to do a technical presentation. And we decided to do a pilot two years ago where we had the theater faculty teach this. And it was like East meets West because the theater faculty came and said to me, what's wrong with your students? <laughs> we asked them to bend over and one person would touch the other one's spine so they could feel what it felt like to stand straight and to own the room. And they looked at us like we were asking them to be really inappropriate with each other. And the students were equally upset and they were like, oh, you're just telling us to do this because we have poor social skills. And I was like, well, um, <laughs> don't, don't record that. Um, it turned out at the end, they could stand up at the end and they could own the room and they were unafraid. 
and they ended up loving it and they loved it so much that we pushed it much earlier into the curriculum and many of our students are now doing a minor in acting and it's really changing the way that people are perceiving computer scientists. Mm, that's great. Major in computer science and minor in owning the room. I like it. Um, <laughs> let's have uh, a question from the floor. Um, a hand at the back. I think we have a mic coming. If we could just keep questions short and to the point, that would be helpful. Great talk, Carla. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I just, it amazes me that more universities in the US don't copy Northeastern because every university in Canada has co op pro right. programs. And, and in fact, co op started in Canada. And um, I'm just curious why you think it is that more universities don't do what Northeastern is doing? Yeah. Um, so we're amazed as well, and, and we do see people trying to, to do some of the stuff. You can do it, a, a university can do it, but it takes a lot of infrastructure. As I mentioned, we have 85 people whose job it is is to help these students to interface with the companies, to bring the companies on campus, um, uh, to make sure that the jobs that the students go out on are meaningful and not just get coffee. Um, and, you know, I think that it's very, um, very challenging. And the other thing is you have to be willing to go to a five-year program because not all students can get through in four years. And what is one of the problems with that? Well, one of the problems with that is in, in rankings. We feel like one of the um, criteria with which you're ranked on by at least U.S. News and World Report is the six-year completion rate. Well, when you have a program that's already five years, you're not necessarily going to do as well in that six-year completion rate if a student needs to take a year off. But I think mostly it's just wanting to put the money and the infrastructure into it. But as young universities, it would seem like you can do this. You could start for one part of your curriculum, maybe just start with computer science, and then broaden it out and start small. Any more questions? Is there a mic? Yeah, it's just coming over here. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm Andrew Disbury from the University of the West of Scotland. Um, this morning we heard about the importance of emotional intelligence. Oh. We didn't get into um, cross-cultural or multilingual discussion, but I wondered whether you have programs linked between computer science and languages and what your views on those uh, students or graduates might be. We don't, um, but we would love to. Um, I will say that as a university, um, Northeastern has um, created opportunities for people to do co-op all, all over the world. Computer science students tend not to want to do that because of the pay that they can get in the US. I mean, the, they start out at $22 an hour, and by the time they're on their third co-op, they're at $40 an hour. And they're not going to make that in a lot of other countries. So instead, what they go out are, are um, courses over the summer called Dialogues of Civilization, where they go to different countries and they study parts about the culture. But we haven't done anything with language. Language is, it's not come up, but it's a great idea. Yes, Brian. And Brian. There is a mic coming. <coughs> uh, Carla, great talk. Thanks very much. I, I'm interested in the Align program, the M MS in computer science. Two questions, two related questions. Are there any prerequisites to go down that program? And secondly, what's your retention rate like for, for students on the program? So there is the prerequisite that you be intelligent. And how do we measure that? So I don't care what grades you got your first two years of college. I find that that's really highly correlated to your socioeconomic background and where you went to high school. So we only look at the grades for the second two years. I also don't think GREs are that correlated. What's really important for me is how well did you do with what you were given when you went to college. So if you were a poetry major who had straight A's in poetry, you are far more desirable to me than a math major with a 3.0 because you have the courage and the work ethic to try something new. So the retention rate is 93%. And when we lose the 7%, 
So we lose a couple people because the age range of this program, the average age is 28 and it ranges from 22 to 40. We lose a couple of people to real life. And by the way, I should mention this program runs only in the evening so that you can have a job at the same time, although a demanding job is not a good one. But uh, would you like a latte grande is a great job. Um, we find that if we lose them, it's the first semester. Because as I mentioned before, 75% of people who try computer science like it enough to take the second class. There's some people who just don't like it. So we've begun to pilot something around um, um, as a way to help students decide whether or not they're going to like computer science. We have a, a, a half day uh, workshop called Hack Your Way Into CS, where first we tell the students well, what are what is a career in computer science, because most of them think it's just programming. And then they get together in pairs, and they do some simple little programming, logical thing to see, does my brain like thinking like that? And that turns out to be a very good predictor. And then we really, because they're all together, because they know nothing, there's a point around November in that first semester where they're all like, oh, I can't do this. But they're all feeling like that. And then the older students come in and say, yes, you can. And that's why we have such a very high retention rate. And, and the prize of a $100,000 salary at the end does not hurt. Mm. We're almost out of time. Let me just ask, ask one last question. <clears throat> I, I'm very interested in the idea of people from a, a background in classics or the arts or theater coming in and, and taking computer science. I just wonder, is there any uh, sort of a a cocktail of disciplines that perhaps hasn't been tried before. Is there anything that's um, perhaps surprised you or, or been most successful from your point of view of mixing disciplines, something that you know, has really stood out as being you know, an extraordinary cocktail that produced stuff that you couldn't have imagined if it, when you sort of went into this? I have to say that theatre major really surprised me. Mm. <laughs> I just never thought that would happen. And actually, I think we're going to... We have our first um, student who wants to do a combined undergraduate major with theater. But if you want to become an academic in computer science, then theater makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Um, so no, not there has been no one single. I've just been amazed, frankly, at the diversity of who, who's had the courage to try this. Because I think it does take courage. Imagine, take, for example, we would be happy to admit you to the program. Thank you. <laughs> I'd be happy to do it. I think in journalism, you know, this is, it really speaks to us, you know, we hire journalists all the time, and if we could get journalists coming in with, uh, you know, some expertise in this area, they would be so much more employable than those that are just coming through traditional backgrounds, and I'm sure that's true of, of most industries now, they would just, you know, snap them up, so it makes a lot of sense. We're out of time, but thanks so much for a, a really interesting talk. Please thank Carla. Thank you.